There are many shows we remember fondly from our childhoods, from the adventures of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to the Saturday morning cartoons of the Flintstones or the Jetsons. But arguably the most famous of these cartoons is SpongeBob SquarePants, a show about an optimistic sea sponge and his daily life throughout his city of Bikini Bottom. We all know the same SpongeBob SquarePants in some way or some form. His popularity translated to a lot of merchandise. From plushes to lunchboxes and phone cases, SpongeBob is a staple of childhood and modern-day culture. While the SCP Foundation's world is one where monsters roam and anomalous events affect millions, SpongeBob and his merchandise is also popular within this universe. The SCP Foundation is most well known for its protection of normalcy and from the most extreme and dangerous threats. Anomalies such as SCP-1730, the Interdimensional Site-13, SCP-001 When Day Breaks, or SCP-682, the humanity-hating, hard-to-destroy reptile. These SCPs pose a direct, obvious threat to the people of the SCP universe. A lot of these anomalies have object classes that clearly state the danger level, along with their level of containment difficulty. Keter, Apollyon, Euclid, and more. Safe class anomalies are not commonly thought of as dangerous, but what about those safe class anomalies that were specifically made to be inconspicuously dangerous to humankind? Today, we take a deep dive into one such anomaly, and we don't mean scuba diving. Or do we? <clears throat> Anyhow, here's a look at SCP-1808, also known as the SpongeBob Watches. Its containment procedures are almost too simple, but given it's a safe class anomaly, it's all about the difficulty of putting it in a box and keeping it there, more than being about its danger level. There are six instances of SCP-1808, and all are kept in standard safe class anomaly storage lockers in Safe Wing C at Site-25. This is similar to the containment procedures of SCP-662, the butler's handbell which is also a relatively safe anomaly, all things considered. The containment procedures also mention that all testing outside of monitored environments is expressly prohibited. It begs the question, if this safe class anomaly can be kept in simple storage lockers, why is there such a strict mandate against testing? What potential danger could SCP-1808 pose that these restrictions are placed on it? Well, to properly answer all of your amazingly inquisitive questions, we need to look back on the story of how SCP-1808 came into the Foundation's possession to begin with. In early April of 2004, the Foundation was alerted to an ongoing anomalous item auction from the anomalous group of interest, Marshall, Carter, and Dark. Anomalous groups of interest within the SCP Foundation's universe are all but rare. From the malicious chaos insurgency that works to harm the Foundation by utilizing anomalies as weapons, to SCP-610, which uses Yaldabaoth worshipping Sarkic cults that work to bring humankind back to a primal way of living. These groups are known for their use of the anomalous for executing their plans. And as we've seen time and time again on this channel, by pretty much any means they deem necessary, let's just say there are not many boundaries set. Or none. Let's go no boundaries. <clears throat> Moving on. When it comes to Marshall, Carter, and Dark, however, they are a bit different from these groups. Instead of calling upon the starfish god like the Fithists, or rebuilding the god of technology, Mekane, like the Church of the Broken God, Marshall, Carter, and Dark have one motive. Profit. This group is solely dedicated to selling and profiting from the anomalous, whether it be through selling to the highest 1% of the 1% or contracting their anomalies out to other anomalous organizations for high payments. Marshall, Carter, and Dark is in the world of leveraging the anomalous for money and as much money as possible. The SCP Foundation normally has a somewhat cordial relationship with Marshall, Carter, and Dark, sometimes even purchasing anomalies from the group for containment purposes. However, Marshall, Carter, and Dark often overstep these bound <coughs> boundaries, causing the SCP Foundation to have to intervene and steal anomalies from them. The story of SCP-1808 is one of these times the Foundation had to step in. An agent of Mobile Task Force ETA-2, buyer beware, Agent Rosser, was working covertly within the ranks of Marshall, Carter, and Dark, attaining information that may be needed for the SCP Foundation's containment efforts. 
Agent Rosser was, of course, under strict protocols set forward by the SCP Foundation. He was to keep them updated with any movements Marshall Carter and Dark may be making, noting any potential anomalies that may need containing, and as always, making sure to be checking in every day. On April 4th, Agent Rosser failed to do his required check-in, and the Foundation immediately deployed other Buyer Beware MTF agents to his last known location, a Marshall Carter and Dark auction house. The raid commenced, and the SCP Foundation, having some of the most highly trained and sophisticated soldiers and agents in the world, swiftly took the upper hand, restraining and apprehending members of Marshall Carter and Dark and their potential buyers. A large-scale search then commenced for Agent Rosser within the auction house, where he was found seated behind a curtain with all six instances of SCP-1808 attached to his body, one on each of his wrists and ankles, and two fastened together around his neck. Agent Rosser was found in a state that could only be described as pure torment. He was unrecognizable. The bones of his fingers and toes were so elongated they circled back onto themselves. The skin of his hands and feet were torn to shreds from the force of whatever was pulling at them. The Foundation-issued boots Agent Rosser wore were ripped as well to make way for the bones. And possibly most ghastly of all, his teeth had grown out of his mouth, tearing the skin of his cheeks and jaw. Could it be that these simple SpongeBob watches were the cause of his torture? There were no other obvious threats observed that could possibly be the cause of these changes to his body. This made the Foundation suspicious and worried. What else could be in store for them? The SCP-1808 file described the anomaly as a set of six yellow plastic wristwatches. These watches are patterned, with green dots scattered along the watch body, along with images of the famous cartoon character SpongeBob SquarePants. The first anomalous property of SCP-1808 is that no matter what mechanical or electronic parts are removed, the watch still operates as if it's perfectly intact. The most dangerous part of SCP-1808 is when it's placed on a person or animal. As long as the wearer has limbs and phalanx bones, SCP-1808's main anomalous property will affect them. Once put on, SCP-1808 cannot be removed unless the person who put it on decides to take it off. Once placed, those wearing SCP-1808 will hear a chime of SpongeBob's famous or infamous chuckle every 15 minutes. If hearing that wasn't suffering enough, SCP-1808's anomalous property will now begin to affect the wearer. After the laugh is heard, the bones in whatever hand the person is wearing SCP-1808 will begin to grow in length. Every 15 minutes, as long as SCP-1808 is worn, these bones will extend about 6 centimeters until the watch is removed. The skin around the bones does not grow, so once they get long enough, the bones will tear through and rip the skin to continue growing. While there is no blood loss once this happens, those who have worn SCP-1808 describe the growing as immensely painful. These changes do not have to be permanent. Should the person that placed it on the poor soul who has to suffer these consequences feel a bit of mercy, they can retract the adjustment knob of the watch and rotate it counterclockwise. Upon doing this, the bones will begin to shrink back to their original size, and the ripped and torn skin will anomalously heal back to its normal state, as if SCP-1808 never affected it. While the physical harm that SCP-1808 inflicts on its victims can be reversed, the memory of the pain and torment the victims went through will be fully remembered, potentially causing further psychological torment even when the watches are removed. The item's description also includes the terrifying note that two instances of SCP-1808 can be placed around a subject's neck, and instead of lengthening any bones in the neck, it will instead mercilessly cause the victim's teeth to grow. In the case of Agent Rosser, we now know the suffering he was going through during his time as a spy for the SCP Foundation. Oof, yikes. The potential danger these watches can pose if in the wrong hands, no pun intended of course, can be devastating. What if an authoritarian government purchased these anomalies? The torture SCP-1808 inflicts upon its victims could easily be used to squeeze information out of a person of interest. Same goes for the Chaos Insurgency, who could use these anomalies to attack the SCP Foundation and gain classified information only someone like a member of the Overseer Command would know. These anomalies had to be contained. The Foundation quickly restrained the Marshall Carter and Dark Agent inflicting this horrible torture on Agent Rosser and forced him to return Agent Rosser's deformities back to normal and hand over the watches. 
Questions circled in the Foundation's minds. Why was there no blood despite the amount of damage on Agent Rosser's skin? And why did the Marshall Carter and Dark agents do this to him in the first place? A Foundation doctor conducted an interview with Agent Rosser, with hopes to figure it all out. The doctor began with a simple statement. Kindly summarize the events leading up to your abduction. Rosser answered, There was nothing crazy about my abduction. I went to sleep in my flat and woke up tied to a table. Maybe I was drugged, but I'm not sure. This confused the doctor. Normally when an undercover SCP Foundation agent is discovered, they are not treated with the relative kindness Agent Rosser was shown. These groups, especially those such as Marshall, Carter, and Dark, normally want information, and will take that by any means necessary. The doctor continues with his questioning. How did Marshall, Carter, and Dark come to discover your identity as a Foundation field agent? Rosser chuckles. <laughs> I was never compromised as an agent. You see, I don't think they were even aware I was Foundation. If they were, they would have called off the auction and gotten their goods the hell out of there. He goes on to say that he didn't even tell his friends or family any details that would have made them suspicious of his rank in the Foundation. Once again, the Doctor was extremely confused by this move on Marshall, Carter, and Dark's part. If they didn't know Agent Rosser was of the SCP Foundation, why did they torture him? The Doctor asks this question to Agent Rosser. If your identity wasn't compromised, why were you abducted and tortured? Agent Rosser responds, I think it was quality assurance, testing the product, making sure it worked, experimenting with it, and if the raid hadn't happened, they would have put me on stage and demonstrated it. Like the SCP Foundation, Marshall, Carter, and Dark are more than willing to test out these anomalies on unwilling subjects. Perhaps they see their employees like the SCP Foundation sees the D-Class personnel. At least the D-Class personnel are death row inmates. They're people who committed heinous crimes, whereas Agent Rosser and his co-workers were innocent people trying to make a living. We see how brutal the world of a profit-driven anomalous group could be with what happened to Agent Rosser, and one could only imagine the horrifying torment the former employees of Marshall, Carter, and Dark may have went through under this so-called quality assurance. Agent Rosser continued with his story. He described the events leading up to the watches being placed on him. He drowsily awoke in the dark room strapped to a table. He recognized the room he was in as the basement. He looked to his left and then his right when his stomach dropped. He wasn't the only one down there. Next to him were people he recognized as his co-workers, strapped to tables like him. After this realization, his shock turned to fear as senior members of Marshall, Carter, and Dark entered the room. We are downsizing, one of them said to the helpless employees. They were going to use them as guinea pigs for their twisted testing of their products. Agent Rosser gets distracted, describing how much he used to enjoy the SpongeBob SquarePants television show. He watched it recently and found it funny, but now all he could think of is that laugh. Every 15 minutes, that laugh signified more torture, more torment that he had to be put through. Now he can't imagine watching the show without thinking of the torment SCP-1808 and Marshall Carter and Dark put him through. While the physical scars are gone, the mental ones still awfully remain. The doctor interviewing him requests that Agent Rosser stays on the topic of SCP-1808. The agent apologizes and continues. First they just strapped the watches to my wrists and ankles and waited. After they were sure the things went off every 15 minutes, he started twisting the little knobs. He describes that he knew he was definitely being tested on. The Marshall, Carter, and Dark senior staff were observing these tests the entire time and even participated. The experimenters would twist the knobs mercilessly until the bones in his hands and feet tore free of the skin and hit the walls of the basement, only for them to crank them back and forth and begin the process all over again. You can only imagine how many times they did this to the agent, for no other purpose but quality assurance. Agents of the SCP Foundation are trained to withstand awful torture so that no confidential or important information is revealed to other groups of interest or the public. Agent Rosser, being trained by the Foundation, would know this training. He attempted to use his training methods to resist the torture, but sadly it wasn't enough. Agent Rosser states, the pain was from the inside. The tips of my fingers were worn off and peeled back like an old pair of gloves. He was one of the lucky ones. Though the people chained to the tables in the same room he was in didn't survive whatever twisted torture they went through at the hands of Marshall, Carter, and Dark. 
The doctor realizes that part of Agent Rosser's story is being overlooked and states, When you were discovered, tours of arches had been joined together and fastened around your neck. Agent Rosser is silent. This was clearly the most horrifying part of the entire ordeal for him. His silence persists for another minute, and the doctor calls his name. Agent Rosser? Rosser shakily begins. Apparently, the Marshal Carter and Dark Senior staff weren't impressed with the effects of SCP-1808, despite the clear signs of pain and anguish from Agent Rosser. They thought it needed to be improved for a higher sale price. One of them suggested placing two of the watches around his throat. Rosser describes how his teeth began to grow. My, my teeth started getting longer, like my fingers and toes, but they didn't go straight. It went off in different directions. Some went inside. Rosser explains that all he could hear every time his teeth grew was that infamous SpongeBob laugh. He goes on to tell the doctor that this torture impressed the senior staff of Marshall Carter and Dark enough to continue with the sale. The memory of this makes Agent Rosser ill, and he vomits before he can even finish the thought. The doctor allows Agent Rosser to be dismissed. Hopefully, he was provided with some Class A amnestics to forget this whole ordeal. The Foundation didn't contain SCP-3000 and harvest the Y909 compound for nothing. The SCP-1808 file also includes a recovered auction catalog that Marshall, Carter, and Dark would have used to describe SCP-1808 to potential buyers. The description goes on to read, These watches are the only products in existence with such uncanny abilities and businesses or individuals wishing to carry out quick, efficient, and mess-free interrogations would be remiss in missing this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to acquire them as would our patrons with tastes for intimate sessions of impassioned discomfort. The starting bid on SCP-1808, only 14,600 pounds. Marshall, Carter, and Dark had no issue selling these watches to those who wanted to inflict awful torture on their unwilling and unknowing victims. And we thought the SCP Foundation was willing to stop moral boundaries. All it took was a little motivation for profits, and Marshall, Carter, and Dark were shamelessly off to the races. For a few rather normal-looking SpongeBob-themed watches, SCP-1808 is truly a terrifying anomaly. Thanks to Agent Rosser's sacrifice, they are no longer on wrists and necks and are now in, shall we say, better hands with the Foundation. In the case of Marshall, Carter, and Dark, they suspended their morality to the point of testing the anomaly on their own employees. I guess this goes to show that profits over people is more than just a scary concept even in the world of the SCP Foundation. Now go check out How Does the SCP Foundation Actually Make Money and SCP-738 The Devil's Deal for more on anomalous business transactions that might just cost you more than you can bargain for.